Let's pray together. God, you are so big and so mighty. There's nothing that you cannot do. You can reach sinners in our lost and hopeless place and redeem us. You can comfort broken hearts. You can give hope to those who feel overwhelmed and weary. You can restore those who are broken. You can unite a people for yourself despite all of our differences. We thank you for everything that you have done for us. We thank you for what a a great and mighty God you are. And we thank you that you love us. And Lord, it's my prayer this morning that if there is anyone in this room who is thirsty, that they would come and they would drink. That this morning as we look at your word, if there are any in this room who are far from you, that their eyes would be opened and they would see that Christ is the way to be satisfied. And Lord, for those of us who are followers already, I pray that as we look at this text, we would be encouraged and inspired to put on the robes of righteousness, that we might be welcomed into the wedding feast for the Son, for his glory and his praise. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So hopefully you're in Matthew chapter 22. We are continuing our little series through the parables of Jesus. We've got a couple more weeks, and then we're going to go into a Christmas series. And after that, uh, in the new year, we're going to start a long study through the book of Hebrews. Um, But this morning, we are going to be looking at the parable of the wedding feast. And I came across a great quote this week from a theologian named J.C. Ryle. And he says that parables are like many-sided precious stones cut so as to cast luster in more than one direction. In other words, the parables that Jesus tells us in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, give us a really dynamic picture of the kingdom of God, and they reveal often several different things to us as we look at them closely. And I think that's certainly the case for the parable that we're going to look at today, the parable of the wedding feast. So let's read this together, and then we'll explore in detail what Jesus is teaching. Beginning in verse 1, it says, And again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. And everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests." But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen." So I actually want to begin this morning with some biblical theology, which depending on your church background, you may not even know what that term means. Let me define it for you. Biblical theology deals with the overall story of the Bible. It has to do with God's plan and how that plan unfolds over time as we read the Bible from Genesis in the beginning through Revelation in the end. And this definition is important to us this morning because Jesus in this parable is actually revealing some of that unfolding plan of God. We're told that the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king 
who gave a wedding feast for his son and invited to that feast a number of particular chosen guests. And we come to see that, unfortunately, those guests responded to that invitation by rejecting it, choosing not to come. And so in response, then, the king goes a different direction and he invites others to come to that wedding feast. So if you're familiar with your Bible at all, then maybe you know that very early on in the story in the book of Genesis, God chooses for himself a people to be his people. He comes to Abraham and says to Abraham, I will make you the father of a great nation and your people will be my chosen people. But then when Jesus comes on the scene, those chosen people that God had called to himself reject him as the Messiah they've been waiting for. And in fact, pretty much the whole Old Testament of your Bible, if you read it, is the chosen people of God just again and again and again tragically rejecting God's love for them. So in our parable then, the king sends out invitations to his chosen guests, that's the Jews, and what do they do? Well, we find out in verse 5, they pay no attention, they are apathetic, they don't care, they busy themselves with other things like checking out the farm and dealing with business, and then we find out that they even beat some of the servants of the king and murder them. And this is a scathing condemnation of the Israelites from the Old Testament. As you read the Old Testament, what you find is that even though God seeks to speak to his people and woo them to himself, again and again they take his prophets and they beat them and they murder them and they ignore God's instruction to them. And ultimately then, the Israelites end up rejecting Jesus, the Son of God, who comes with a message of God's grace and they kill the Son of God himself. Now, as a result of this outcome, we find in the parable two things happen. First, we're told in verse 7, the king is angry, understandably, and he sends an army to destroy the murderers and to burn their city. Now, at this point, this parable is more than just a cute story Actually, I would argue here that Jesus is giving a little bit of prophetic warning to the people that are listening to him teach this parable. Because not long after Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead in 33 AD, in 70 AD, the Romans besieged the city of Jerusalem and ended up destroying it. They slaughtered a huge number of Jews that were living there, and they tore down the temple of the Jews with such ferocity that even now, 2,000 2000 years later, the temple remains a ruin. This destruction of the temple, in fact, was so catastrophic upon Judaism that essentially Old Testament Judaism, as it is practiced in the Bible, came to an end. No more temple sacrifices. And the Pharisees themselves, who we as Christians maybe know so well because we find them in our Bibles, their rule and reign religiously came to an end as well. The temple was destroyed and Judaism was forever changed. And so verse 7 then in our parable hints at this future destruction that God intends upon the city of Jerusalem. The second thing the parable reveals is that when the Jewish people rejected God tragically, well, God used that to advance his plan of salvation into the next stage. Instead of his wedding feast being exclusively for the Jewish people who in the end rejected him, after burning their city and destroying them in verse 7, verse 9 tells us what did the king do? The king who represents God sent his messengers out into the roads to invite anyone and everyone who would respond to the invitation to come and be welcomed into his party. And this is basically the great commission of Matthew 28. This is where Matthew is going to ultimately end his gospel with Jesus saying to the disciples, his servants, go, go out into the ends of the earth and make disciples of all nations. And so once again in our parable then, Jesus is giving 
a prophetic picture of the future, where the kingdom of God will be offered not exclusively to the Jewish people, but in addition to the Jewish people, also to the Gentiles, all the people who are not Jews. Now look back in your Bible with me at chapter 21, verse 43. We didn't read this, but you should see it. Speaking to the Pharisees just before this parable of the wedding feast, Jesus says to these Jewish religious leaders, Therefore I tell you, in chapter 21, verse 43, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and it will be given to a people producing its fruits. In other words, because the Jews failed to have faith in God, they ended up rejected by God, and God then sent messengers out to find people who would respond to his invitation. And so there's a sense in which we can say, I think, that we actually find ourselves here in verse 10. I mean, we find ourselves in this parable. First of all, because I'm guessing most people in this room are not ethnic Jews tracing their lineage back to Abraham, which means that we are Gentiles. We are the people who were out in the roads, who were invited into this feast, not having received the first invitation, but being invited still. And then we find ourselves in the parable again because in the unfolding plan of God's salvation, we are now made servants, sent out to invite others to bring that message of the invitation to the wedding feast to anyone and everyone so that the party that the king has thrown for his son might be full of people rejoicing and celebrating with the king. To say it another way, as Christians serving the king, we are tasked with taking the gospel message, the good news of Jesus, out to those who are willing to hear, inviting others to join us at this wedding feast. This is our mission as Christians. Did you know this? Did you know that as a Christian, You actually have a mission for your life to go into the world and bring people into this party so that, as the king says, his wedding feast might be full. And I pray, this is my prayer, that this mission will be at the very center of the heartbeat of our church. You know, Maricopa has something like 80,000 people living here now who need to hear that they are invited to this party. Okay, so there's a little bit of biblical theology for you, a brief overview of God's salvation plan, kind of from Genesis to the parable. Let's look a little bit more closely at the actions of the king. If it's not obvious, the king represents God. And first we're told in verse 2 that what motivates this king to throw this lavish party is to honor his son on his wedding day. Jesus is the son of God. He is the son of the king. And the Bible tells us that Jesus has a bride. Did you know that? The bride of Christ Jesus is the church, the people of God. We are the bride of Christ. I mean, one small representation of it in time and in location on earth. The people of God to whom Jesus has pledged his life and his faithfulness now and forever, we are the bride of Christ. And at the end of history, after the resurrection from the dead, the people of God will spend eternity in the presence of God, celebrating with him all that Jesus did to give himself to save the church, to save a people for his own glory. And if you trust in Jesus, guess what? You get to be at this party. And I promise you there will be nothing like it. But what I want you to see here is that the king actually did not throw this party for you. He didn't throw it for you. In fact, you know what? The bride is never explicitly mentioned anywhere in the passage. Did you notice that? We're told about a wedding feast for the son of a king There's no mention of the bride at all. The focus and all of the attention is on the son. Verse 2 tells us the king throws the party for his son. 
that his son might be honored, that his son might be exalted. And look, I want you to understand something very important here, okay? This story is not about you. It's not. See, we live in a narcissistic age. We are a self-obsessed people. We're the kind of people who post something on social media and five minutes later want to know how many likes, how many views, how many shares. How many people are talking about me? Everywhere you turn, our culture is telling you it is all about you, about how you feel and how important you are and what you deserve and what you need. And we are so self-centered that we could even read a text like this and hear that we are a part of the bride and the king is throwing a party and think, this party is all for me. And it's not. God has not worked this whole historical plan through all of the ages of history for you. I'm sorry to tell you, God has not planned all of this for your sake or my sake. Now look, there is a sense in which this is true, so don't misunderstand. God does love you, and he loves me, and he treasures us so much that he sent his son to shed his blood and die for you, so you are not insignificant. God has brought about the working of this master plan so that you might be saved and loved and redeemed and well cared for throughout all eternity, that you might be called a child of God. That is all true. We are the bride of Christ. But come on, get over yourself. It's not about you. You are not the central figure of this story. Let's take a dose of humility. Let's stop thinking about ourselves for just one second because more than anything else, do you understand that Jesus gave his life on the cross to honor the king? He did it for his father in obedience to God. And therefore, God, the king, at the end of all things, is planning a party not for your honor, but for the honor of his son, for the glory of of Christ. And you know what? The wrath of the king in this story, did you notice how upset he gets? The wrath of the king in this story is not because the people who were invited didn't show up. It's not for their sake that he's mad. Why is he mad? Not because they will miss out, but because they have dishonored his son by refusing to come to the party the king has thrown in the honor of his son. And so I just want you to understand this point. The gospel is not actually about you. It's not. You are the beneficiary of all good things because of the gospel. The gospel is for you. But the gospel is not about you. The gospel is about Jesus, the son of the king. It's all about his love, his power to save, his beauty to redeem. It's all about his glory and his grace towards undeserving sinners like you and like me. And so the wedding feast is for the son, praise God, and we are blessed to be invited as guests. Now, having said that, look at the goodness and the kindness of the king in this parable. Look at all of his effort to get the guests to come in so that his son might be honored and so that they might enjoy this lavish ceremony. He's patient and he's generous. He's eager to see people come and celebrate this party. He's eager for them. He sends multiple invitations to those he originally invited. Look at verses 2 through 5. I think actually kind of off camera, there was a prior invitation that was made. And when the first kind of invitation in the text comes, it's really just a, hey guys, remember the party is coming. And he sends multiple invitations. And you know what I find most amazing? They reject the invitation. What, can you ima- what kind of person rejects an invitation to a party from a king? Like, I don't care who the president is. If you get a handwritten note in the mail from the president of the United States saying, come to a party at the White House, you're going to go. 
And if, and if it's not the president, then think of some billionaire or some famous movie star, some rock star. I mean, that's probably about as close as we can think about this. But who rejects an invitation to a party from a king? And when they finally reject him so offensively that the king has to destroy their city and eliminate those murderers, you'd think he'd be like, you know what? My kingdom is full of ungrateful people. I'm just going to party with me and my son, right? No, what does he do? He sends servants out to find anyone and everyone, anybody they can find, let them know they're invited because the king wants people to come. And even look at verse 10. Doesn't it throw you off a little bit? This place where it says that he doesn't even discriminate between those who are bad and good. He seeks to fill his house with people so that his son might be honored and so these people might be joyful. In a minute, we're going to get to verse 15 that deals with uh, the idea of those who are chosen. But what I want you to see here is that the parable very clearly gives us this impression that nobody is excluded. Nobody is excluded from this offer, this invitation. It is an open and sincere invitation by the king to anyone who will receive it. Come. And what more could the king do? He's prepared the banquet, he's sent out the invitations, he's set the table, he's made his home ready for lavish hospitality, he's dispatched his servants to call those with invitations and also those without invitations, he's slaughtered the fattened calf and the oxen. What more could he do? Again, J.C. Ryle says it well, he says, there is nothing lacking on God's part for the salvation of sinners' souls. No one will ever be able to say at the last that it was God's fault if he is not saved. The Father is ready to love and receive. The Son is ready to pardon and cleanse guilt away. The Spirit is ready to sanctify and renew. Angels are ready to rejoice over the returning sinner. Grace is ready to assist him. The Bible is ready to instruct him. Heaven is ready to be his everlasting home. One thing only is needed, and that is the sinner must be ready and willing himself. So I guess my question for you at this point is a pretty simple one. Will you accept the invitation? Will you come to the banquet? Where else would you rather be? Would you seriously be one of those people who the invitation is extended to and you say, no, I don't want to be at the wedding feast of the king? It is the will of the king that you would come and give honor to his son. Won't you come? What would stop you? Verse 10 tells us the wedding hall will be filled with guests. Won't you choose to be one of them? So the invitation to the wedding feast of the sun, it's a free invitation. And right now, I am acting as one of those messengers, proclaiming to you the invitation. If you've been waiting for God to do something in your life, here it is. He is speaking to you. You are invited. Come now. Repent and believe and enter into the joy of the king. But then the parable goes on to tell us about this interaction between the king and one of the guests who shows up, right? Having invited everyone and anyone to enjoy the feast, the king then enters the room in verse 11, and I think he's expecting to find that since he has prepared so much, everybody who's there would be appropriately prepared to celebrate with him. And he sees there a man who's not wearing appropriate clothing for a wedding. And seeing how generous this king has been, I want to tell you that I think it's safe to assume that the king, having prepared everything else, certainly would have had the appropriate clothing prepared and ready for anybody who needed it. Right? In this period in history, most people only had maybe one or two changes of clothes. They couldn't afford to have a separate wedding garment And so I think it's proper for us to 
believe that the king here would have had all of this ready for his guests. If you came from the road and the king had said, go into the roads, then we could expect the king, when you came in, would have robes ready for you to put on. He would have thought of this problem. And notice, I'll make the argument from the text itself. Notice that the man is speechless when the king says to him, friend, how did you get in here with clothes like that? And the man is speechless, which I think means he was dressed improperly, not because he did not have access to the proper clothing, but because he chose not to put it on. He has no good explanation for why he doesn't look the part when everybody else is dressed to the nines in honor of the sun. And so as a result, he's tossed out of the party. Now here's what I think this scene, this part of the parable means. The invitation to repent and believe and enter the kingdom of God, that is a free invitation. It is made truly and sincerely to everyone, even to you, even to people like me, the good and the bad. But if you accept that invitation and you choose to come to the party, then you also accept certain obligations. There are expectations. You should dress for the occasion which is to say that if you are going to come to the wedding feast that is put on in honor of the son of the king, then you better come in an honorable fashion. Your life must be honorable. You need to not only respond to the invitation and show up, but you must also put on the likeness of Jesus Christ so that he is honored by your life. And I don't know what your exposure to Christianity is. I don't know what your church background is. But for, but for far too long in our country, people have been taught a false gospel. And that false gospel says that you can believe in Jesus and go to heaven. That's all there is. You don't need to wear the robes of Christ-likeness or righteousness you just sort of have this thought somewhere in your head, yeah, I think Jesus is real and he died for my sins, and then that's it, and you go to heaven. But to be a Christian, you need to understand, is not merely to believe in Jesus, it is to be made like Jesus, to wear his righteousness. Yes, you are invited to this party by grace, whether good or bad, the invitation is extended to you. But once we enter into the hall of the king, man, our lives had better honor the son. That's the expectation. And friends, you cannot stick around the wedding feast of the king unless you wear the robes of Christ's righteousness. You cannot join in this celebration while you continue to wear the filthy rags of your sin. You got to get rid of that and put on the wedding garment. God himself has supplied the appropriate attire. There's forgiveness for all of your sins in Christ. You can wear clean clothes, no longer the filthy rags of your sin. There's holiness available to you through the Spirit of God, which dwells in those who have faith in Christ. You have the commands of Scripture clearly laid out for you so that you can obey them without confusion. You have the church to support and encourage you in this journey. All that you need to stay in the feast has been prepared for you. The robes are provided, but you must put them on. You must wear the righteousness of Christ in order to dwell in the kingdom of God. And if not, then I want you to be warned, you won't get away with this forever. The facade, the hypocrisy on the day of judgment, you will be exposed for what you are. If you're not wearing the robes of righteousness, if you say, yes, I just have faith in Jesus and like I go to church, but I don't actually follow Jesus, 
then there is a day in the future where you will stand before the king and he'll say, how did you get in here dressed like this? My son made all the provision for you to be here. How is it that your life dishonors him by looking like this? And you will be tossed out. And if you don't seek to do the will of God in this life, friends, you need to understand, you will find no joy in doing the will of God forever in eternity. That's what we're learning here and now is to joyfully do the will of God so that in eternity we can do it joyfully forever. And so the invitation to come and repent and believe, it's free and offered to all, but it is followed by the obligation to obey to wear the righteous robes which Christ the King provides and expects. Now finally, the parable ends with this rebellious man being cast out of the wedding feast by the command of the King. And Jesus concludes the parable with verse 14, For many are called, but few are chosen. So the gospel message must be proclaimed far and wide to the ends of the earth. I think you are one of those messengers. That's why God has placed you next to your neighbors and with the people that you work with. It's why he's made your friends have the friends they have and the parents that you connect with, etc., etc. But we find here that not all who hear will be received and welcomed into the kingdom, only those who are chosen. And this is uh, the part that really tends to bother more than a few people. They don't like this idea that the king gets to choose, as if the choice of the king means they have no choice in the matter, as if these two things must be opposite one another. But I want to tell you, it is the sovereign right of kings to do as they please. See, you and I, we don't understand this because we live in a democracy. In a democracy, supposedly, you and I are sovereign. But the people listening to Jesus tell this parable, they would have had absolutely no bother hearing this. They would have listened to Jesus and found no problem with this statement. A king gets to do as he pleases. That's the very nature of a king. That's part of what it means to be a king. A king is actually above the law because the king is himself the law. And God, don't you understand, is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And there's nobody who has a power or authority that supersedes his. He's the creator. He's the author and the origin of life. He sustains all things. He's the ruler over all things. There's nothing higher or greater than him. All that this God wills shall come to pass. And there is not another will that can stand against his will. And so it is the prerogative of the king to choose who attends the feast for his son. Now, There are two ways, I would say, there are two ways that you can respond to a message like this, this truth. You can get upset about it. You can try and claim the Bible says something other than it says. I think you're going to find that difficult to do. You can be offended by the message that the king is the king and you're not. And you can think it's not fair. You can lament over all the people who are not chosen and believe that this makes God into some kind of tyrant who is actually evil in his nature because he exercises his right as God to be God. And you know what's really amazing about that? I think that position is actually quite offensive to God, but what's amazing about it is God will actually let you have that position if that's what you want, at least for now. I think when you stand before the king, you'll understand what it is to be king. But actually, for now, you're free to think that way. But it doesn't change the fact that God is still the king. Now, the other option is, instead of being offended that God is king, you can hear the invitation and you can just respond to it. Don't you understand? The invitation has been truly and freely offered to you. And right now, in this moment, the only thing stopping you from entering into the feast of the king is 
you, your choice, your decision. And so there's no use getting upset that you aren't chosen when the invitation is right here, right now for you to choose and accept and respond. And so here's the message. If it wasn't already clear, come to the party. Please, please come to the party. You are invited. Put on the robes of righteousness that are offered to you by Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin and place your trust in him, not in your own efforts any longer. Step in to the kingdom of God and join us at this feast. We want you to be there with us. Come into the presence of the king who has made every provision for you. Who, though the party is for the glory of his son, actually longs to give you a seat of honor at his table. Here is your invitation. Receive it. What prevents you? I would tell you in this moment, nothing hinders you from responding except your own choice. And see, in the end of the parable, all of those outside of the feast in the darkness, don't you see? They are either those who refused the initial invitation or who, who upon responding to the invitation didn't dress themselves properly for the occasion. Although it is the king's right to choose, there's no indication anywhere in this parable that the king sought to keep out or exclude anyone from coming to the party. He sought only to bring people in that they might honor his son. And so rather than get upset at God's sovereign right to choose as king and lord, just humble yourself and come to the party. Please, you're invited. As verse 10 says, the wedding hall will be filled with guests. Won't you be one of them? Won't you come? And if you already are one of them, if you are already a Christian saved by grace, then won't you serve this king by being a messenger and taking that invitation out to others? Won't you participate in the joy of the king by telling other people, there's a wedding feast that's been prepared and you are invited. Would you come? So that this wedding hall might be filled with guests in honor of the son of glory. Let's pray together. Lord God, you know that this week I've been, again, praying hard for anyone in this room who is not already at the feast, that they would hear this invitation clearly and they would respond. And so I pray that prayer again, Lord. If there's anyone in this room right now who is outside of the kingdom of God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would pierce their heart and open their eyes and lead them to faith in Jesus, that they might be at this party. And Lord, for those of us who are already Christians, I pray that you would help us wear the robes of righteousness and cast off the robes of sin. Jesus, you promised that your burden was easy and your way was light and it doesn't always feel that way when we're struggling against sin. And so I pray that we would be comforted by the truth that the, these robes of righteousness have already been provided for us. That it's our responsibility only to walk in what has already been done for us. So would you encourage us in that? And would you make us wholehearted in that endeavor as we seek to be like Christ? And we thank you that all of history is not about us, but it's about the glory of your son, Jesus. And I pray that that would bring great delight to our hearts as we worship him. In Christ's name, amen.